Let us move now into Van Til's Actual Theology of Common Grace. The title of this lecture is The Holy Spirit, Natural Revelation and Common Grace, and the New Relation After the Fall. And so if you're curious about how to put all of this together, you can review any of the modules that we've done in the past about this new relation and God's condescension to Adam in the garden, the implications of sin. But we're going to be developing these things now in concert. Common grace requires us to think uh, in a little bit more detail and sophistication. Van Til deals with the common or non-saving witness of the Holy Spirit to the truth of general revelation before and after the fall on pages 58 through 64 of Common Grace in the Gospel, where he's interacting with Hep. And we need to spend some time developing this, and it's going to take some time because Van Til now brings into view the correlation of these three features, the Holy Spirit's non-saving witness, the content of natural revelation in the deeper Protestant conception, and common grace. And we're going to talk especially about how the new relation after the fall, the movement from the Spirit's testimony to general revelation pre-fall and the Spirit's testimony to general revelation post-fall, how that changes, how that relation changes. In broadest terms, the emphasis on the Holy Spirit connects a Reformed doctrine of revelation to a Reformed doctrine of common grace. The Holy Spirit's agency has been significantly underappreciated in the thought of Van Til on this very topic. Van Til sought to apply Calvin's theology of the general work of the Spirit in common grace to Calvin's theology of natural revelation, the census divinitatis. So if you want an overview of what Calvin's seeking to do, Calvin's seeking to unite Calvin's theology of the Holy Spirit, Calvin's theology of natural revelation, and Calvin's doctrine of common grace. He's seeking to be consistently Calvinistic on this topic. Now, as we move into the treatment of this material, uh, pages 58 and 64, and we might make reference to other portions of Van Til's corpus, I think we can say about his relation to Hep and Bavink on that, for that matter, is that he had a critical appreciation joined to a critical reformulation of their approaches. And while we'll not deal with the special internal testimony of the Spirit to the Scripture, which we could do, where he persuades the church of the truth of what is revealed in Christ and the Scripture, we are going to spend the lion's share of this lecture, at least up front, dealing with the general testimony, internal witness of the Spirit to the truth of natural revelation and its bearing on our understanding of common grace. As we begin, Van Til seeks to build on the best in Bavink and Hep, observing that Bavink in particular, quote unquote, prepared the way for the idea of the general testimony of the Spirit. And by the way, that's to both general and special revelation. Hep sought to develop that general testimony to the truth of what God has revealed in nature. So if you think of it this way, the creator-creature distinction is in place. We've got it backgrounded here in the upper portion of the board. And now we're speaking specifically of one person of the ontological trinity, the Holy Spirit, and how he is bearing witness to or testifying to the truth of natural revelation in the pre-fall situation, we'll use Adam as our example, and in the new relation occasioned by sin in the post-fall situation. Hep argues, and Van Til agrees with this, that there is a 
general witness of the Spirit to the truth of natural revelation before and after the fall. Hep says that this testimony of the Spirit in general, quote, assures but does not reveal the truth of God in general revelation. That's on page 58 in Common Grace in the Gospel. Ventil adds that for Hep, and Ventil does not disagree here, quote, this general testimony does not assure me of all truth, it assures me of central truths only. The distinction on which Van Til approves hinges on the fact that the Spirit testifies to the truth of general revelation, but is not a substitute for it. So if pre-fall Adam, as the image of God, is surrounded by revelation from within and from without, the book of conscience reveals God, the book of nature reveals God, the Holy Spirit gives a witness to Adam of that truth. That's the point. The Spirit testifies within us, Pep says, to the truth of Scripture, and the general testimony of the Spirit testifies within us to the truth in general. So, Internal revelation, the book of conscience within man. External revelation, the book of nature outside of man. The Holy Spirit testifies to its truth. And so Van Til says that in this conjunction of God revealing himself in nature and the Spirit testifying to or witnessing to that, you have a truly Calvinistic conception of the Holy Spirit's relation to natural revelation. This, the Spirit, in a non-saving way, witnesses to internal and external natural revelation surrounding Adam in the Garden of Eden. And Van Til appreciates this general emphasis. Van Til agrees wholeheartedly to the Spirit witnessing internally to Adam in the garden regarding the truth of natural revelation in Adam and outside of Adam. However, on page 60, Van Til expresses concern about Hep's formulation when he develops, quote, this is Hep's own language, the marriage of the general testimony and revelation that underwrites his notion of the fide generalis, faith generally conceived. Van Til says, we come to the most pivotal point of all. And he's quoting now from him. From the marriage of the general testimony and revelation of the Spirit, Faith is born. Whatever the internal testimony attests to the external testimony in nature, man cannot withhold his assent, and faith always consists of giving assent by means of one's reason to some witness or other. Hep calls this the fide generalis. Now, what's being said there? Let me try to pinpoint this. Van Til's going to offer some criticism of this. But Hep is saying that even after the fall, after the fall, in this new relation of wrath and curse, the Spirit continues to give testimony to the truths of natural revelation, bringing about a general faith that characterizes believer and unbeliever alike. Hep goes on to say, Van Til's quoting him, taken generally, mankind does not deny these general truths in nature witnessed by the Spirit. By far the greater majority of men recognize a higher power above themselves and do not doubt the reality within and beyond themselves. 
Van Til says, here we reach the climax of the whole matter. There, and this is the quote, there are central truths to which the generality of mankind because of the irresistible power of the Spirit's internal testimony must of necessity give their consent. The point that Hep is making is very straightforward. If the Spirit testifies to the truth of general revelation after the fall, that testimony elicits consent from believer and unbeliever alike. Ventil says that's the climax of the whole matter. After the fall, the Spirit, in a non saving operation of common grace, testifies after the fall to the truths of natural revelation, and this brings among sinners and unbelievers alike consent. There's a consent according to hell. Van Til says this by way of criticism, and now we're going to start to move in a, a more positive direction. Van Til says Hep is unable to escape making concessions to a Roman type of natural theology. Page 61, Common Grace in the Gospel. If we keep in view what we've developed in previous lectures, Van Til's concern should be rather obvious to us. Let me frame it in a, in a simplified way. Is it the case that after the fall, believers and unbelievers can agree on the general truths of natural revelation because the Holy Spirit constrains mutual consent. Is there such a general shared platform of mutual consent between believers and unbelievers to the general truths about God, man, and the world to which the Spirit bears a non-saving testimony. Is common consent possible after the fall when it comes to believer and unbeliever? Well, given the way that sin corrupts the entire nature and places the natural man at enmity against God, not able to to submit to God or please God. Van Til argues there can never be consent to the content of natural revelation after the fall, and there can never be common consent to the Spirit's witness to that truth. Why? Because in natural theology, and this is key, the relation between God and Adam changed in Adam's original sin. And so I have up on the board here that when you start to think concretely about the situation, before the fall, the Spirit testified to the truth of natural revelation, and, and pre-fall, Adam accepts that testimony. He gives his consent before the fall. After the fall, Adam rejects that general testimony, and withholds consent. Why? Van Til's point is that when you're thinking about the content of natural revelation before the fall, and the Spirit's witness to that natural revelation before the fall, Adam was in natural religious fellowship with God. He accepted and consented to all that God revealed within him and outside. But Van Til's point, and this is critical that we're going to develop, a new relation emerges in the fall. So that in post-fall Adam, this idea of some kind of ge generic consent to what God reveals in nature and attests to by the Spirit, he rejects and withholds consent after the fall. Why? Because there is a new relation that affects Adam, natural revelation, and the Spirit testifies to that new relation. 
Let us think this through. When Adam sinned against God, Adam changed in the sense that he fell from his original relation of fellowship to God to being at enmity with God. Genesis 3, 14 and 15, God speaks of Adam and Eve at enmity with him and says, I will reverse that enmity. Second, the relation between God and Adam changed in that Adam fell from a relation of favor to a relation of wrath. So you have a relation that is described in terms of unqualified favor before the fall. The new relation of sin with post-fall Adam is a relation of wrath. There is an authentic, bona fide, historical transition from favor to wrath as Adam moves from the estate of innocency before the fall to the estate of sin and misery after the fall. So it moves from fellowship to alienation, from favor to wrath. But God remained immutably holy and righteous in his relation to Adam, both before and after the fall. So from the human side, after the fall, Adam did not assent to the natural revelation of God and did not assent to the Spirit's internal testimony to that natural revelation. If you want an image for how Adam began to relate to God, both in the natural revelation and in the general internal testimony of the Spirit to that revelation, here's the image. Take his hands and what? Suppress. Adam began to suppress that truth that God made known in nature and to which the Holy Spirit testified. Westminster Confession 6.2 and 9.3 put it so well. Listen to the anthropology. By Adam's sin against God in the Garden of Eden, both Adam and Eve and their entire natural posterity, quote, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, became dead in sin, wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. 9.3. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation, so as a natural man is altogether averse from good and dead in sin. So, let me put it this way. The corruption of Adam's nature is that his mind is darkened, his will is enslaved, and his affections are corrupted by original sin. This comprehensive but not consummate corruption impacts how the sinner relates to God's natural revelation and the Spirit's testimony to that natural revelation. And the revelation and the Spirit's testimony in history is new after the fall. From favor to wrath, from fellowship to to enmity. But, further, what does effectual calling do, according to Westminster Shorter Catechism 31? The Spirit convincing us of sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, persuades and enables the embrace of Jesus Christ freely offered in the gospel. Before that effectual call, before the mind is enlightened, the will is liberated, and the affections set free from desiring the corrupt things to delight in God, before that happens, there is not a natural consent to any of God's revelation. That's Van Til's point. So when Hep and other Reformed theologians speak of a consent of unbelievers to the general truths of natural revelation and the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. And that general consent between believers and unbelievers is a neutral platform. Van Til says that is not dealing with what? 
the anthropological heart of the matter. It's not dealing with the Reformed doctrine of sin. So Van Til says this is a natural theology of a Roman Catholic, traditional Roman Catholic sort. It is a semi-Pelagian corruption of sorts. So to summarize this, what we'll call the natural theology of the Westminster Standards, Westminster Confession 6.2 and 9.3, that natural theology of the Westminster Standards tells us this, that the unregenerate in, listen, in the new relation after the fall, the unregenerate do not by nature consent A, to the natural revelation of God, nor B, to the general internal testimony of the Spirit to that revelation. Van Til detects in Hep a concession to a natural theology of Rome precisely at the point of the necessity of a universal consent to the general truths of God, man, and the world. Given the effects of original sin according to Scripture, as summarized in the Westminster Standards, the unbeliever will not consent to the truth that natural revelation discloses the wrath of God against him. Or, that he is suppressing that truth in unrighteousness. It is precisely on this point that the unbeliever will register disagreement. There is no wrath of God revealed from nature. There is no disclosure of judgment. So Van Til is saying this, to summarize, that what we think about the movement from Innocency to sin and misery, from favor to wrath, from the historical before and the historical after of Adam's fall into sin. This line I have right here, this new relation is of absolute importance. Not only, do, listen, not only does Adam change, but the revelation of wrath in history, is new. Adam's nature as fallen is new. The revelation of wrath in history is new. It was not revealed until Adam's sin. So there's a conjunction between Adam's fallen nature and the disclosure of wrath and the Holy Spirit witnesses to both. The Spirit's witness, this is Van Til's point, is that Adam is now fallen. Adam is now corrupt. Adam is now guilty. And Adam is now under judgment. And the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against him and his natural posterity who do what? Consent to it? No. Who suppress. They don't consent. I'm going to go ahead and X that out. They don't consent. Romans 1.18 uh, through 20. They suppress the truth. And what truth is that? It is the truth revealed from heaven by God to which the Spirit bears testimony. That's Van Til's point. And so, as useful as Hep is in pointing out the natural revelation of God and the general truths revealed, as useful as Hep is in talking about the Spirit witnessing both before and after the fall, to these truths. Van Til saying that general truths consented by all is too abstract. It does not deal with the concrete, specific content of Adam's nature, the natural revelation of God's wrath against his sin in the new relation, nor the Spirit's testimony to Adam's sin and to the wrath of God. And so Van Til says, we need something better. We need something different. We need something more consistently reformed that avoids this semi-Pelagian Roman Catholic variety of natural revelation that simply talks about 
general truths that all can consent to. Van Til's point is after the fall, such general truths don't exist given the new relation that joins Adam's fallen nature to the revelation of God's wrath from heaven in nature and the Spirit's testimony to each. On that platform, Van Til says we can pursue a concrete conception of the Holy Spirit, natural revelation, and common grace, but we must move away from the Romanizing tendency that Van Til sees in Hep and in others. Now we'll continue to look at Van Til's positive presentation as we move forward on page 61 and see his argument develop.